Welcome to the IT Experience Podcast. This is our monthly IT Exam Insights episode, where we go through the current developments in the IT Experience Management world. Let's get on with this month's insights. Hey, welcome to this month's IT Exam Insights episode. Hey, Zachary, how are you doing? How is France? <laughs> I'm doing good, thank you. I think winter came back here as well as it did in the Nordics. Just no snow yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, it's just middle of April and, and or end of April even, and uh, still snowing in Helsinki. So this is just oh, waiting for the summer. <laughs> Me too. But hey, Sakari, you just, uh, we were touching this a little bit in the last episode too. So you just now released the Global IT Benchmark Report. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? And, and for people, you can find it at happysignals.com slash report. Absolutely. And it's always uh, very fascinating to look into the benchmark data. And I think one thing that is uh, in this report was very interesting is to once again understand how important it is for organizations to have understanding about the experience of their end users. And some of the key findings uh, in this report are focused around the industries uh, that the IT organizations are working in, how experience differs between different industries how it uh, differs between different company sizes and also uh, thinking about the support profiles. And our report is very extensive. So there is a lot of sort of traditional data about the service desk and IT support, but also information around the overall IT experience across a number of different touch points. And maybe one of the things that I would like to highlight is how remote work has now become the highest rated IT measurement area in the Happy Signals benchmark data at plus 82. And that is quite interesting seeing now that four years after everybody went remote, it finally is so established and so well working that people rate it the highest. Yeah, Another you can even, is, see, even see it from, from last year that even in, in one year, you know, it's been increasing so much. But yeah, please continue. Yeah, absolutely. But these are the averages on a global scale. But then what the real findings were in this report is under is also looking into how, how big the differences can be within, for example, individual industries, how the best performing companies in certain industries can reach extremely high levels while similar industries uh, or similar companies in the same industry struggle to get there to the same levels of experience. And yeah. I really invite you to go to the uh, report and read it. And for example, one of the things they will see is that finance and insurance is the happiest industry uh, out of all. And technology is the one that has the most critical and the least happy end users with internal IT. Yeah. So, but I would say go to read the report. There's so much yeah. to read and you will find dozens of illustrations, visualizations and insights about what actually makes for good support and what yeah. our data tells about IT experience. Yeah. And you can also download it for yourself. And there's even a webinar link on that page. So if you want to hear more Zachary explaining these numbers to you. So like me, you don't want to read that much information, but you maybe <laughs> want to more consume it when, when somebody's telling you and picking you the, the key things, you can watch the webinar of, of that uh, report as well. Hey, thank, thanks for that, Zachary. And then I think for this month's topic, what we are talking about is the future of IT support. And uh, something we created on our, our blog is a crowdsourced view on this topic. So we send out many, uh, for many thought leaders, their the request to give their insights, give their view on this topic. So let's go to, start going through with this, Sakari. But uh, you can go to our website. You can open this blog post. Uh, of course, the link is in the show notes as well. But uh, it's really tied into following groupings and categorized experiences and productivity, increased people centricity, proactivity, enterprise support, technical competency, increased reliance on ITSM tools and new technologies. But we'll pick a few of these with Zachary, and then again, feel free to go and read the, read the whole blog post. But maybe if we start, Zachary, from the, from the experiences and productivity will matter more. Uh, I picked one sh short quote from Neil Keating here. So XLAs will be the primary way IT success is measured in the future. 
And maybe this also relates to something that when we start talking about future of IT, there's many times been talking about AI, having chatbots and these kind of things. And many of our customers, for example, ask about how do we measure AI? How do we measure the chatbot? But really, still, when you bring in new technologies, you need to, again, think what Neil just said, is think about the experiences of the end users. Keep measuring those. So you still need to measure the experience of the service. It doesn't matter if it's been delivered by AI or by a human. Because if you think it otherwise, it would mean that measuring AI would be just like measuring agents. And this is really the old way. You start uh, ranking your agents based on some scores, when you actually should be thinking about the overall end-to-end -end experience of your end users. And our customers, for example, are measuring that already today. Now, if you start improving the channels, you start improving the, the way that those, those requests and incidents and things are being handled, you don't have to start measuring them. Of course, you can do this in a project way that when you create something new, you, you ask from people like, what is it? How do you feel about it? But that's like a one-time thing. This continuous measurement of experiences is still about end users' experience on the end-to-end -end things. Anything you want to add on that, Zachary? No, I think this links very well together with, with what we speak always about human-centric IT support. It's, it's understanding in the bigger picture what, uh, what the support mechanisms, channels, and ways of providing that support, how they impact that end user experience and putting the right labels and the right things and looking at them from the right angle. Yeah, and I think this is a good donkey bridge, as we say <laughs> in Finland. You can Google that or ask from ChatGPT, what does it mean? Uh, one of the main topics, again, in categorization from the thought leader was increased people centricity. And uh, here's a quote from Sophie Hussey. The future of IT support will likely involve more automation and AI, but with the ever-increasing focus on experience and excellence, a human-centric approach should remain a foundation to service provision. And I think you, Sakari, picked one, uh, one example that has been now in the, in the LinkedIn and probably in the, in the other medias. Uh, you want to go through that one? Yeah. So I think uh, we have touched upon this in previous episodes as well, that there is this uh, dream about having an IT support where incidents don't exist anymore and AI handles everything. So they could just automate the entire experience of getting support. And what Klarna did was something that got a lot of people a little bit maybe uh, worried about how fast this change is happening. And um, they implemented in, uh, in the beginning of the year, an AI assistant that had 2.3 million conversations. So two thirds of Klarna's customer service chats, um, in the first months of its use. And it was doing the equivalent work of 700 full-time service agents. But the interesting part about this article was that the customer satisfaction score was actually on par with uh, human agents. And, but once again. There is nuance to this story because what those agents were doing before was that they were reading from scripts, they were searching in knowledge bases, and they were doing all kinds of things when it came to just receiving information or a request and then finding the suitable matching answer from the knowledge base. So it was something that actually AI is very good at doing. So it is at face value, it seems shocking that AI would replace 700 full-time agents. But then when you think about it, was the work done by those agents actually something that was providing the highest value to the end users? And there was somebody else who had looked into this story and understood what did actually the chatbots do. And one of the things that it did is that it redirected to human agents whenever it deemed it better for humans to solve the, solve the tickets or these requests. So there was still a collaboration between technology being used in the best possible way by humans. So I take my hat off to Klarna for having yeah. being able to manage something like this and actually doing it seemingly in a good way. Yeah, I think like you mentioned, it's uh, it's I think probably the key here is the data behind it. Yeah. So they had this understanding of what are the common repetitive things. 
and I think that's maybe something that that uh, what experience data also gives you is understanding what is being what is a very repetitive thing. And I think one of the very common things that we see in enterprise IT is the password resets. Yeah. So you you get an outsourced partner a vendor, and then you hand them over a password reset as a manual service. And there's not really a a uh, incentive to automate it or or do it like you do it in consumer world. Like, no, when we do password resets in our consumer life, we don't really talk to people. We feel that it must be automated. And I think this starts to be the, the thing at the enterprises today as well. Let's say like five years ago, it really wasn't. Uh, and I think probably in many cases still today, you need to need to do it through through a person. But putting these kind of things into the hands of, of the AI is the is a really good way to way to start. And I think Klarna again had this data. They had an understanding what to automate, and that's what where they were really successful on. And again, like you said, then just hand it over to to a person, not trying to do it if it if it feels like chatbot. It's it's just being put in a corner and goes round and round and round and and starts creating a bad experience for the for the human. Yeah. Yeah. No, very interesting case, and I'm sure that we will see as uh, AI and capabilities improve, we will see more and more implementations where this interaction between humans and machines is more and more seamless. Yeah, and I think this can take us to the next uh, next category on the on the blog post, which was proactivity. And uh, Phyllis Drucker said that I think the biggest imperative is to eliminate user downtime. Hmm. So just like we said, I mean, if you just focus on that. Uh, it gives you a very simple approach to the topic so that uh, you're not focusing on some, you know, trying to innovate something weird, but you just focus on what where people waste time and just uh, try to eliminate that with the help of AI. Yeah. Um, the, the next topic was the creative technical competency. And uh, I think this is a quite interesting thing. So uh, Doug Rubbold, quoted here that uh, frontline support will be more technically skilled to deal with the complex issues that can't be resolved effectively through self-service and AI. So, Yeah, this is a uh, really good quote, um, especially thinking about the Klarna example, but also thinking about um, in general what, uh, what support would be looking in the future. And the greater greater technical competency by agents. They could use AI to also to understand and uh, issues quicker. They could use uh, the same capabilities to look for information and uh, and bug fixes and solutions and so forth. So once again, the, the interaction between machines and humans is not just limited to end users using the tools having been built on a self-service level, but also maybe then the agents when needed to in, improve their technical cap- capabilities and learning about what works and what doesn't. Yeah, and I think this also, uh, we can use the, the awesome statistics from your global IT benchmark report, which says that 13% of the tickets contribute to 80% of productivity loss. So basically that 87% of tickets, you could pick from that the ones to automate and just leave more time to the human agents to actually solve those difficult things and also then to increase their technical capabilities and make it also more motivating and interesting work because you don't have to do that repetitive continuous thing just like Klarna did in, in their case. So take away those those tickets that people are super happy, don't really lose time on and just waste agents' time. So, yeah, Absolutely. And, and I think that... Have you ever heard any IT leader say that our agents don't know what to do with their time? I haven't. I mean, they're <laughs> always pressed for yeah. time. There's always too many tickets to solve. And if these new technologies can help agents actually have enough time, not too much time, but just even enough time to solve the tickets that are more complex, that's a great use of technology in that case. Yeah, yeah. Then uh, the next category was increased reliance on ITSM tool capabilities and guidance. And you picked something here, Zachary. So do you want to go through that one? 
Yeah, so David Stewart uh, uh, had this quote, due to lacking operational maturity and resources to bring about improvements, I can't see that many IT organizations can adopt AI, including chatbots, which mu with much success or too much extent. And this is the thing that uh, IT, when thinking about implementing new tools, they should also consider what are the what are the teams and the people and the competences that are internally available? Are we ready to take on these tools or will they actually maybe even lose productivity from, from the IT teams trying to figure it out? So I think something that we tell our uh, customers often when they start with IT experience management is move slow to go fast or go slow to go fast. And I think when implementing these new technologies in IT teams, leadership managers and directors should consider how can we do it in such a way that it becomes, has time to become a natural part of the support work that IT is doing and thinking about that operational maturity. Yeah, that's really good. And uh, I actually use that now again as a donkey bridge uh, for the, the <laughs> next, next and the last category, which is new technologies will improve IT support. So one of the the reasons I think why experience data and the usage of experience data in the operative world is because of lack of time. Let's say that a big enterprise that has tens of thousands of, of end users, they get hundreds of feedbacks a day about the experiences of end users. Having time to actually read through those is so time consuming that most likely people don't do it. So that's why at Happy Signals we have implemented generative AI features for our customers that actually summarizes what people are saying. So you can easily grasp what are the main reasons why people are unhappy at certain topic. Uh, and that really helps you to get that, that grasp. And then maybe you can, it gives you an interest to read a few of the deeper, you know, like the individual comments around it, but to really get this this kind of thing. And I think Roy Atkinson was in the blogs mentioning that you can use this also summarizing the, the notes on your, on your cases. And, and like you said earlier, trying to, you know, get to the root cause faster. So using this, this IT, these AI tools in the, in the IT department so that they can deliver faster service for the end users and better services is, uh, is I think already something that, that you can to, do today. It's not, a, it's not any more future. It's, uh, it's today. You can do it now. Absolutely. And then what you said at AI tools, and that is something that people who are much more knowledgeable than I am in uh, AI use in IT are saying that we should look at it as tools. They are not yeah. replacing people, it, they are tools. And that is something that is also highlighted in some of the other articles that uh, we have found for this week's podcast. And do you want to yeah. maybe uh, look at uh, some of them? Yeah, let's go through. So there was a... Uh... On Wipro's site, there was this why your IT service desk won't be there tomorrow. Anything you want to summarize on this? So, well, we just uh, point people out there and kind of let them read it. <laughs> yeah, I think in this one, once again, the, the uh, title itself is uh, something that is quite enticing that why your service desk won't be there. But when you read the article, they say, once again, use technology for where it's useful, but also then uh, agents take care of the more complex issues. So there is the same yeah. theme once again, use AI as a tool and then let people use their time on what they are better at. Yeah. And then there was a uh, six service desk trends uh, from Innovate. So uh, this was a few months ago published. And again, go read this. I think it starts highlighting those same topics again and again. So I think we are just like pointing this out with Sakari that, that you know, this really is the trend that, that this, the, the industry is going towards and uh, not just us think, talking about it. And the last one was uh, digital etiquette by Adaptavist. So anything you want to say on this, Zachary? I think one uh, aspect that I found uh, interesting in this article was uh, the thinking around uh, um, future and adopting services to how work is changing. And I think as work is changing, we know that uh, humans, humans as sensors, we say that humans are the best sensors. And because of that, uh, uh, needing the time to change, uh, I think uh, Adaptivist has made a really good uh, article about how, how IT support should be thinking about that whole change. 
but yeah. interesting article. I could talk a half an hour about <laughs> in any one of these individual articles and speculate on what it means for the future. But but yeah. go to the show notes links and you will find those articles well worth reading. Exactly. So how would you how would you summarize the, the future of IT support soccer? I think it having looked into this now uh, no, no, through the benchmark report work and also these different external resources, one could summarize it like this, that to improve IT support service, we should let machines and humans do each do what they do best. Machines are great for quick tasks and data handling. Humans are great at understanding and solving complex problems with empathy, something that only humans can feel. And by combining the strengths of both, I think the future of IT support looks very bright. And in all cases, regardless of what you're using as the tool, whether you're using your own brain or an AI and powered a tool, it still is very important to understand how people feel about and the service provided, because that's the only way you will understand if the experience is improving or not. So humans are and will always be the best sensors of IT support, since humans are the only ones that can experience things. Yeah, well said. And I think on that bombshell, we can end this, this uh, <laughs> month's uh, episode. So thank you for joining us. Uh, hope to get uh, hope to get you with us again next month. And as we usually end it, uh, stay safe and stay happy. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this month's ITXM Insights. This is available as an audio podcast through our YouTube channel and also as a newsletter. If you haven't yet registered, please go to happysignals.com slash ITXM Insights.